You are listening to the Nightly News Podcast, the voice of the Knights. Welcome, everybody, to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Paul Miller, and I am so honored to be joined by Dr. Erica Wilkinson. Uh, Dr. Wilkinson has recently rejoined Central Penn after being here earlier in her career, so we want to talk a little bit about that journey, also part of the Bridge to Success program in which she is overseeing, and also, of course, the cute little puppy you've seen around campus, Toby, and the pet therapy dog that uh, she's been bringing on campus. So, uh, Dr. Wilkinson, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, and, and I, I did say welcome back. Uh, I, this is your first podcast, so this, this is the first is. time you've actually been on the show. It so is. welcome to the show as Thank opposed to you. welcome back. Uh, so tell us a little bit uh, about this position that you're in, and we'll get to the whole full circle thing, but just tell us a little bit more about the position that you're in and some of the things that you oversee. Sure. I was brought in uh, to start full-time in, for the winter 24 term in January. Um, I am the Associate Vice President for student services. So I report directly to Romeo, sort of being his right hand, um, to help with all things related to student affairs and student services. Uh, Specifically, the success coaches report to me, um, as well as all activities, engagement related to the learning hub. Um, We, of course, work closely with everybody within the student services division, um, but those are specifically my areas. So looking to build um, the... I would say my primary responsibility is student retention. Um, But for those of us who've been in higher ed for a while, that that comes in many different ways. So we're looking at it from both academic support, student engagement, also providing like food security, transportation, just a variety of different, meeting the variety of needs our students have. And part of the reason we have our other guest here, the vice president of the Nightly News Media Club, Brett Savaleski. Part of the reason we're having you here, Brett, is you've done some really good work with promoting student involvement around campus, not only through your coursework, uh, you just recently did a speech in my persuasion class about that, but also trying to get other people involved on campus. So that's part of the reason we have you here. And Brett, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Professor. It's good to be here. Well, and Brett, let's start with that. Uh, Talk a little bit more about your experience, not only just being a part of the nightly news, but also therefore advocating for students to be involved on campus. What benefits have you seen, not only with yourself, but with uh, some of the research that you've done in how campus engagement makes a, a better college experience? Yeah, so like you said, I just did a speech about this kind of thing last week for uh, for your persuasion class. And one of the really interesting things I read was a study that was done, I think, in Canada in like 2014, 2015, and that found that It basically took two sample sizes of students at a college, one where the students are very active in their college, they're involved in clubs, activities, stuff like that, and another one that's essentially just there just to get their degree. And they found that the students who were involved reported much higher grades, much higher college satisfaction, better networking, and all these different benefits versus the students that didn't. And I find that with myself whenever I'm engaged in campus and I I'm meeting people and I talk to my professors and my peers every day. It makes me excited to be here. It makes me want to do well. It gives me that extra layer of responsibility for not wanting to let people down, really. And there's so many different activities that you can get involved with on campus. There's a ton of clubs, a ton of events. There's so much stuff that you can do on campus. And that provides an endless opportunity, endless amount of opportunities for students here. And that's something that Definitely very grateful for with this school. Well, and that's one of the things, too, is not only are you part of the the nightly news and you've done amazing things in a very short period of time with, with us, you're also a work study with career services and the athletics department. You've also helped us out with events on campus like the film series. I mean, what is your perspective of, you know, you're you're a little bit different than maybe somebody right out of high school, but you're still a daytime student and you're still getting really involved. So what are some of the keys that you found in order to, to manage time? Because a lot of times if I talk to somebody, Brett, that uh, about getting engaged on campus, the, the time issue always comes. So talk to me a little bit about how you're able to manage your time and, and some tips that you might be able to give students to help them get engaged on campus. Yeah, so every single week during our terms, I take about 
30, 45 minutes on Sundays to literally write down every hour of my week that week. And every day, whenever I wake up, I rip a page out of my notebook for that day and I keep it in my pocket for reference. That way, like, I know exactly how long I need to be somewhere. And I also give myself little breaks in between in case things go long. Uh, or in case I finish stuff early, give myself breaks for lunch, for snacks, to exercise, stuff like that. And I found that writing stuff down uh, really adds, like I want to ch be able to check things off there. And that makes me satisfied at the end of the day because I look back at it and I'm like, wow, look at all the stuff I got done today. So yeah, that's probably the best advice I have is write out your week, plan ahead. Don't just try to just go through and do things as you see fit. Wing it. Yeah, don't wing it. Do not <laughs> you, wing it. You know, I don't know about you, Dr. Wilkinson, but if you would look at my Outlook calendar, you would be blown away because, I mean, literally, to Brett's point, most of my day is pre-prescribed. Like, I, there's really very often very little room for me to get off track because I have everything kind of lined up. I don't know if, if, you, if you operate that way, too. I would say it's about 50-50. I need the flexibility to be available when a student needs me, right? So I need to be able to budget my time in a way that I can make sure I get my deadlines met um, because I do have some responsibilities um, with Romeo and projects and things like that. But I would never want to turn a student away and say, I'm too busy. Busy, right? So I try to keep my schedule, I try to pre-plan and get things done ahead so it allows me that flexibility to be adaptable to when a student might need me. So let's go back uh, on the calendar, I don't know, eight or nine years. Uh, you were obviously a major part of this campus when I first stepped onto campus. I've been here since 2013. I can't even believe it at this point. It's next year, 12 years. But um, So you were one of the, the administrators at that point. So tell mm -hmm. us a little bit what did you used to do? A little bit about the, the journeys between the two times and then what brought you back to Central Penn. Sure. This is going to date me a great deal, but I want to go back. I think it was about 2003, uh, 2002, 2003. I was actually an adjunct faculty member. Um, so I did start on the faculty side. And I will say that has always been my passion has been the teaching. Though I do like the dark side of administration, I do find my passion still lies greatly with, uh, with teaching. But at that time, I was an adjunct. Um, I was primarily teaching out of our Lancaster campus, but also doing a great deal online. The college had just appointed a new dean, Eva Stein, as our dean for online services. And as that um, population of students was growing, she recognized the need for what we now have and call success coaches. So at that time, I think I was like the online education coordinator fancy term for a success coach. And so it was my job to sort of help adult learners bridge coming back to higher education, as Brett mentioned, balancing their time, scheduling multiple responsibilities with work and family, but now also school, and then helping with registration and just processes that were many for first generation students the first time anybody had ever done it in their family. I would say I went into that, I don't know the year, my son was in first grade, right? I sort of benchmark things by my children. So um, my it was January of my son's year of first grade. Uh, Eva had reached out to me, had this opportunity and offered me, and I was very excited to come on because I really saw the future for online education and wanted to be a part of it. Well, what's really interesting about that is being a, a current PhD student at, at one of the, the state institutions, of, uh, I'm perfectly happy with, but I will point out during COVID, we didn't have the same troubles as other institutions, both locally and, and statewide in that we had had an online program for a decade mm -hmm. plus, well, almost to your point, a decade and a half right. at that point. Yep. And so for us to move basically everything online, of course there were challenges. I mean, I, <laughs> nothing goes perfectly. But I got to be honest, in comparison to not only some other local institutions who I know people who do teach there mm -hmm. and my own my own situation going through a doctoral program, which was supposed to be on campus. A lot of these schools just weren't unprepared, yes. not even from a faculty perspective, but a student perspective, too. So many of these students were so used to going on campus, it was just an entirely different experience. So that was one really good thing that we had because we had such a great foundation. And I think it had I think it spoke to the leadership's recognition of the student population that we had and recognizing the number of adult learners that we served and looking at the campus holistically in that there shouldn't be 
somewhat of a thought between online and on ground. So if you were a fully online student, you were still encouraged to come for on ground office hours or come use the library if you needed it. And then on the opposite side, if you were a fully on ground student, you should still have access to those resources that were covered in the classroom. So it was a nice synergy between the fully online delivered courses and the in-person classes by using Blackboard as that platform that sort of merged and connected both. So I think to what you're saying about COVID, that vision of how we created that really did help make that transition for the college a lot easier. So I don't want to get into anything, you know, out of school or anything like that. But, you know, you did move on to a different position. And, and we can talk about that if you like. Sure. I mean, sure. So, nope. so share with us. Uh, during your time, uh, your hiatus from yes. Central Penn, yes. um, where, where were you working? What were the types of things you were doing there? Sure. But just to give a little context, um, I didn't leave the college for any negative reasons. I loved working here. I loved what I was doing. But I had been doing it for about six years. Shortly after I started, the dean had left and I was promoted to dean of online. And I had that opportunity for six years. And I feel like... You know, sometimes you have to recognize your limitations. I, I think I grew the pr program as much as I could based on what I knew, and I felt professionally I needed to grow. And so an opportunity at a, at a Institute of Higher Ed in Lancaster became available. Um, and you're also from the Lancaster area I as am. well, so I'm sure that yep. fact factored into it. Yep, I am. Um, and, and it was working with a school that focused on health science, which was a whole new area for me. So that professional challenge really sort of enticed me. Um, and so with the support and love of everybody I worked with here, I moved on. And that was in 2014. And I went there to be the um, director for faculty development. I was asked to help sort of support their flipped classroom, um, which many of you are used to, where you have to prepare before you arrive to class. Um, so that was something their faculty were struggling with. Um, most of them were clinicians, not educators by trade. So there was a lot of professional development with faculty that needed to be done. And, and again, as I said earlier, that passion for teaching really enticed me with this position. Um, and then I was very blessed with um, the opportunities I was given. And in the nine years I was there, I was rapidly promoted through several different roles and ended as the vice president for strategic enrollment management. And I oversaw all of enrollment management along with student services, which um, again, sort of aligns with my passion here. By, again, no choice of my own, that institute uh, was being purchased by another bigger or larger uh, university out of Philadelphia, and they weren't keeping the uh, executive team. So knowing that, um, it gave me the opportunity to decide what I wanted to do next. And as you said, having come from Central Penn, um, keeping up with all that was going on here, the new president had come in since I had left, I saw Romeo's position. And not speaking for him, but good, bad, or ugly, he worked with me before. And so I knew we had a really good working relationship. So I reached out and intrigued and learned about the position and was happy to say they they decided to go back with me. So I got to come back in January. Full circle. Yeah. You know, one thing I did want to uh, ask you, Brett, uh, Dr. Wilson had mentioned the flipped classroom. Have you participated in any classes that have used that model, i.e. much of the coursework is done outside of class and the class time is spent doing assignments, working in groups, those types of things. And what were your impressions of that? I did. Uh, I took college algebra with Professor Hummel. I believe it was my second term here. And yeah, you basically you have to, he has all the lectures pre-recorded. You go in, uh, you watch him, you take your notes. And then in class, he gives you like a warm up question just to like increase like classroom engagement. And then we talk about it a little bit. And then the rest of the class is just spent just doing your homework, basically. And he's available, of course, for any questions. And I, I, did, I did think it was interesting, especially for an algebra class, to not you know, have to go through the grind of just sitting in class. And it was an 8 o'clock class of just looking at numbers on the, on the board. So I, th I feel like for like general education, it's definitely a good choice. Yeah, and I think I've tried uh, things like that in certain classes that maybe are more conducive to that. But one of the things I've really tried to do is working a lot more opportunity for group work. And I think you've seen that in some of my classes. Uh, so we do try to, I don't think it's an all or nothing approach. I think even if you're not necessarily participating in the idea of a flip classroom, you can still take elements of that and then try to get more group work in the classroom as opposed to just being straight lecture all the time. Right, exactly. Again, at my prior institutions, because 
the faculty were primarily clinicians, they viewed themselves more as an expert, right, and not an educator who was supposed to facilitate learning. So unfortunately, many of them took that sage on the stage approach where they just stood up in front of the classroom and lectured. And I'm assuming as I look at Brett Shaker's head, that's not maybe always the most conducive form of learning. So t- teaching them how to use the components of a flipped classroom just sort of added to that toolbox, which like, as you mentioned, Paul, you use in your classroom, you know, to just create a variety of learning opportunities because we know students learn in different ways. So yeah, it really expands the, uh, the experience. Well, one of the things that you have done since you have returned to Central Penn is over. you are now overseeing the Bridge to Success program. If you've been around campus or, or read your you know, Student Central or Central Stations, you know that the Bridge to Success program is something that takes place every week during Common Hour and has different types of programming. So first, tell us what is the Bridge to Success program, above and beyond what I'd said, and what are some of the reasons that you decided to spend so much time and effort doing this? Sure. So the Bridge to Success was a program we put together um, that provided opportunities for students from various programs um, to come together in the Learning Hub to experience some co-curricular events. So by co-curricular, we purposefully looked at the IDS 101, I believe, uh, syllabi. And they had eight major outcomes that they had looked at, financial literacy, um, resilience, um, planning, some of those kind of topics. And so those students may have gotten that in their first term. As you move on, those are skills you still need to build and you still need to grow. Um, So we kind of looked at that outline, plus took feedback from students on topics that we knew were challenging for them, like test anxiety, preparing for exams, things like that. Um, And so I partnered partnered with academics to find ways to build what I call 30-minute impactful moments. Okay. It's not meant to be a class. It's not meant to be a lecture. There's no technology. It's engaging. It's discussion. Um, And it's just, again, providing students with a quick takeaway right? One one takeaway they can get on a topic. And so, so far we've done things like um, relaxation, right? We know mental health is a big area of concern in higher ed, and we want to make sure our students recognize the signs of stress and anxiety and ways to look at relaxation. And so we did a breathing technique. And if they take nothing else away from that, but learn how to use deep breathing as a way to center themselves before an exam, before a public speaking event, you know, that was our objective. That was our goal. Coming up, we have topics on financial literacy, because we know that's always an important topic for not just students, but all of us. Um, We're going to work with the library to talk about how to use charts and graphs and how to read them and use their information for when you're doing presentations, like Brett spoke about, the research he did. There's oftentimes a lot of charts and graphs, and help with interpreting them can be very useful. Um, We're going to have guest speakers come in and talk about resilience, because we're very aware that our students have challenges that they face every day. And seeing someone who's gone, like, walked a similar path and has been successful can help motivate students to realize that they have that potential as well. So I'm very excited about the program, as you can tell. No, and I think it's wonderful. And every single time I see photos or a write-up about it in in Student Central and Central Station, it looks like you're getting some fantastic participation. Uh, So what I would suggest for everybody is, number one, always take a look at your Student Central. Each week, Elijah Tinson does such a great job sending out the activity schedule. More information is about that on there. Of course, you can always check out the uh, student uh, activities calendar on in your Outlook. And of course, also you can reach out. I can put your email along with this if you have any Absolutely. questions. If anyone has any questions, they can reach out to you about that. But That'd certainly the Bridge to Success program has been a success thus far and seems like something you're going to be continuing, right? Yes, it will go on every term. And I've been asked a lot if it will be brought online for the online population or the you know maybe the evening students who can't be here. And that is absolutely the vision for the program. So I'm hoping by winter of 2025, we can then roll out a parallel program. So it wouldn't necessarily be in tandem with the daytime program, but it would be something similar for virtual students or evening students to be able to participate. Uh, But my hope was to work out any bugs or kinks with the first pilot program. And I would love to assist in any way I could with that because one of the things that I struggle with with my online classes, and, and this is back to what Brett was talking about earlier, is that online engagement. So many of our online students, some 
not interested in being involved. Mm-hmm. They've got their own thing going on, and more power to them. If if they're you know, I get it. They're juggling a thousand things, but there are a lot of people that are online that do want to have some type of of engagement with other people. I mean, if you're in an online class. Other than, you know, maybe here or there interacting, maybe on a discussion board with your fellow classmates, there's very little FaceTime that you sure. get with anyone. Yep. So I would love the opportunity to maybe integrate that into one of my classes. I if would you love need that. somebody on your pilot team, let me know. I and will. I will find a class that would be conducive to it because I really think that people want that. I don't think people just want to go to class online, you know, do their online class, turn in their work, and that's it. I mean, part of college is... Not only gaining, hopefully, some type of mentorship, Mm -hmm. but also developing a network of your classmates. And so I think that that would be something that uh, I would love to be a part of. Well, I appreciate that because, you know, again, like I was saying, because I haven't been here in nine years, I wanted to make sure I fully understood our student population, what their needs were, what program, what format would work best for them. And so trying to pilot something initially on ground gives me that chance, like I said, to get sure. work out the kinks, work out the bugs, and then move it forward. But I will leave out a teaser that we have new programming that will be starting in fall. So maybe um, if I not if I do well on this podcast, you could have me back and I can talk about You're our- welcome anytime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can talk about uh, the next program we'll be launching in the fall. That would be wonderful. I'm always looking for I'm always looking for uh, more people to be on the show. Well, I do have one more thing that I want to talk about, and and that is, of course, the cute little pup that <laughs> has run around campus. I'm sure you've seen him if you have been around, and that is Toby the therapy dog. So, first of all, how did you get Toby to be a therapy dog, and why did you feel that this is something? Because it's something you do every week, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, when I was at my last institution, we would have K-Pets, Keystone Pet Enhanced Therapy Services, come to our campus to see our students. But I recognized the value of it from a staff perspective. And it was always my favorite day when the dogs came. And I would sit on the floor, and I would pet them, and you could just feel your blood pressure dropping and your stress dropping. And uh, right about at this time, as we started going into COVID, my daughter was already in college. My son was graduating high school in 2020. And I said to my husband, what is our community service? Like, what is our volunteering? Because we were always so wrapped up with our kids. Kind of parallel to that conversation, we decided to get the next dog. And I said to him, if we get a dog, I want to train it to be a pet therapy. And that's going to be my civic, you know, responsibility, my give back, my community service. And so we got Toby right at the start of COVID, like 99% of the population all got pets during that time. Um, And Toby is a mini golden doodle. And because we purposefully knew we were going to do pet therapy with him, we picked a litter that was 75% poodle and only 25% golden retriever to make him more hypoallergenic, which then makes him more accessible to a student population. Um, I would ever, I would hate, unless someone's highly sensitive, most of the time, even if you have a dog allergy, you're okay with Toby. So um, knowing that uh, with K-Pets, the dog has to live with you for at least six months. So if you rescue a dog, um, they have to live with you for at least six months and they have to be at least one years old. So during that first year, we went on the website, we learned a lot about what attributes a dog has to have to be a therapy dog. And we worked hard to prepare him. Um, Pulling on his ears, not heart, but right, right, you know, manipulating his face, manipulating his paws, rolling him over, teaching him to be submissive, sort of desensitizing him to groups of people, loud noises. Um, I take him to Lowe's with me every time I go, you know. So we we started his training right from day one. And then he was actually one of the youngest dogs to be registered by K-Pets. He was only 18 months old when he got registered as a K-Pet therapy dog. Um, and so every other Sunday I would take him to, um, a drug and alcohol rehab hospital to see the patients there. And when I was interviewing for my AVP position, I actually sort of negotiated the ability to bring the therapy dog because I, I have found it is an amazing icebreaker for the students, right? And that, um, you often will let your guard down with the dog and students will relate to me, not as an administrator, but just as a fellow staff member who cares and who's available. And I'm sorry, I'm biased, but he is so darn cute. (laughs) Like, how do you just not want to stop and pet the puppy? So that's Wednesday mornings, right? Or does it vary? No, it varies. So because, uh, we switched to our new block schedule, right? A lot of students are here Tuesday, Thursdays and Wednesday, Fridays. So I moved away from trying to do like a Toby Tuesday or a Wednesday. 
Wednesday morning because then it would isolate populations right. of students who aren't really available. So um, I try to alternate each week. He's usually here mostly in the morning, um, but I did bring him, I think it was last week I brought him for a party on the patio. He was a big hit, um, though he was mad I wouldn't you know, buy him any French fries. So, <laughs> um, Well, and Brett had a really interesting opportunity last term as part of a project that we did in public relations in that he actually got to volunteer for the Humane Society. Uh, he participated in a walk that they did along with another student. And, you know, one of the biggest issues when we did CPC Gives Back, I believe, uh, two years ago, we got to work quite a bit with the Humane Society. And I was so surprised that they are still feeling the effects of that point that you made earlier about how many people purchased animals at the beginning of COVID. By the time COVID, I don't want to say came and went because it's still, you know, we're always going to live with it. But in terms of the lockdown, so many people realized that they, they couldn't take care of this pet and had to surrender the pet. And that was one of the things that I learned specifically from volunteering with the Humane Society is that they're still dealing with that yeah. four years later, which it's is incredible. really hard. Yeah. And uh, we were very blessed in the fact that, um, my husband never went back to the office. So coming out of COVID, he remained working from home. And so Toby is a very spoiled puppy on the couch with daddy on the days he's not here at the college with me. I'm going to go to Brett for the final word. Brett, what did you learn from your experience with the Humane Society through that whole process in terms of some of the things we're talking about? Yeah. So the event that I volunteered with was their Walk for Paws event. It's basically a 5K color run and a mile long walk to uh, raise, a, raise awareness of um, animal neglect and just collect donations for the Humane Society. It was at Hacks Campus, and I was just absolutely blown away at the turnout they had. And it was like horrible weather. It was raining during the run. It was just miserable out there. And there was probably easily over a thousand people That's awesome. while I was there. It was amazing. And just the reach that a that a nonprofit like that can have within one specific community is just something that I I'd, I'd never experienced before. And it was it was an incredible experience. Well, I'm so glad to hear that. And again, I, I thank you for your civic participation, and hopefully you get to work with them again. Well, Thanks Dr. So. Wilkinson, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad to have you back. You've already made such an impressive uh, return, triumphant return to campus and some of the things you're doing, like the Bridge to Success and the Therapy Dog. Uh, we can always keep an eye out for Student Central to find out more information about that. But again, if anyone has any questions about any of these things or wants to get involved, I'll put your email along with this. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. And I will pencil you in for the fall so we pencil can talk me in more. For the fall. And you can pencil me in for running your pilot program with the online version well, of Well, this Bridges. was wonderful. Thank you both for having me. I'm so excited to uh, to share what we have going on and be back on campus. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on, even though we are in a little bit of a hot podcast <laughs> studio. Uh, Brett, and thank you for joining us today. And again, I, I just can't thank you enough for all the things that you do, the promotion of student engagement, everything you do with the club, the athletic department. I'm looking forward to working with you for another great uh, season of sports here at Central Penn. Yes, sir. You got it. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Nightly News Podcast. I wanted to thank Dr. Erica Wilkinson and Brett Savaleski for joining us today. Until next time, we'll see you. Greetings, knights. This is Sir Will, your mascot, and you're listening to the Nightly News Podcast. Huzzah! Welcome, everybody, to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Paul Miller, and I'm so honored to be joined by one of our esteemed uh, colleagues here at Central Penn College. It would be the Associate Professor of English, Dr. Flora Armetta. Dr. Armetta, this is your second time on the podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you back. You were here last time when you were doing the CPC Film Series. I was. Thank you so much, Professor Miller. And uh, one of the interesting things is you did Knives Out, and since then, we've gotten a sequel and is is the second one out yet the second one is out okay so yep. there have now been two sequels to knives out so we're looking forward to maybe we'll start there you know what did you think of the the sequels of these films i did see the second one i hadn't seen the third one yet okay wait are you talking about the glass onion yes okay i saw that one i didn't know whether the third one was out yet. The second sequel third movie correct yes i don't believe it's out yet i could be mistaken i know that they filmed it they greenlit it 
mm-hmm. with Glass Onion. So what did you think of the Glass Onion? Well, I love all the actors who are involved in the Glass Onion. So I thought from that perspective, it was just as pleasing as uh, Knives Out. I did not find the sort of reveal and the uh, time structure of that movie quite as pleasing. I don't know if the first one, I I just hoped for a second along those lines because I try not to be sort of a, I'd like the second cookie to taste exactly like the first one kind of person, Um, but I wasn't quite as impressed. I actually got to see it. So one of the things that I think that they should do for some of these streaming only films, which Knives Out, uh, you know, essentially was, they did release it in the theater for a limited showing. And I did actually go to the theater to see it. And I I really liked it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, one of my favorite films growing up, Beverly Hills Cop, just released to Netflix. The new one didn't release in the theater at all. That's unfortunate. I know. And that's one of the movies I would have loved to have seen in the theater. And I I guess I just don't understand. I, I understand, yes, the film industry has changed. But there are still a lot of people, just look at Deadpool and Wolverine, oh, that, movie that, is amazing. that want to go <laughs> to oh the gosh. theater to see movies like that. So I don't yeah. understand why Netflix, even Knives Out franchise, is a Netflix property. And Absolutely. they did that limited release. I don't understand why they didn't do the same thing for Beverly Hills Cop. But hey, more a critique on the film industry as a whole. So um, yeah. we'll, keep, we'll, we'll keep posted for the third, third movie. Also being joined today by a nightly news reporter and work study here and our news correspondent, of course, Noah yeah. Lopez. Noah, welcome back to the show. Hello. Hello. Thank you. I was actually, I wanted to chip into that movie discussion because, like, I have to say something. Go ahead. Um, Glass Onion, I thought that was, it was a goofier movie than the first movie, and I think that's what kind of underplayed the stakes a little bit. Like, it was like, okay, all right, we're just joking around here. But Mel Blanc was still such a cool character, <laughs> and I did love how he was, how he solved the mystery, but mm-hmm. again, like, I already knew who it was in the beginning. I was like, okay, it, it's uh, the, don't the don't say it. I'm person. not gonna say it. I'm not it's gonna that say person. it. I'm not, it's that person. I'm right. that person. Right. And on the topic of Deadpool and Wolverine, and uh, you Which know I movies being released yet. digitally. First of all, Deadpool and Wolverine is the best movie that Marvel has produced since Endgame. I, I, really, it's that good. Okay. It is actually amazing. All and right. if you're an, if you're an X Men fan, you will love the movie. I love good. the movie. And Hugh Jackman back is the best thing I, we could get in a long time. And just movies being released digitally, I think, is a really bad idea. Um, one good example was, uh, I think they released Megamind digitally. It was the second Megamind movie. It was the worst thing ever. But it was released digitally. And I think it's better because it would have flopped in the movie theater so bad. But well, maybe releasing movies yeah. digitally, like I think Black Widow was a movie that got released digitally. Well, the one that was because of COVID, but not a lot of people saw it. Not a lot of people know Is it that existed. that one with Dakota Johnson? Yeah. Yeah, I saw. I unfortunately saw that one in the yeah. theater. Really? <laughs> Sorry, you wasted your money. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it had... I think that would have done better on a small screen because it does change your feeling about the pacing that you're expecting and the amount of sort of excitement that comes in every X amount of seconds. I feel like there was a kernel of a story in that one that was worthwhile. It was okay. They could have done so much more. They could have done so much more. I think releasing it after Endgame also kind of downplayed the (laughs) character's arc, like... Yeah. Why are we doing this now? Why didn't we do it beforehand? You know, and yeah. as much as you know, I love talking about movies. I do have an award-winning winning film podcast called Nights at the Movies. Oh. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think we're going to solve all of Hollywood's problems here on our podcast today. But I do, <laughs> right, of right. course, appreciate that. And one final sort of postscript to, to our little discussion there. We have come up with the film series for fall. Oh, that's uh, exciting. Professor Susan Black will be presenting Sleepy Hollow. That's cool. The Friday before Halloween. Brilliant. So I really hope that you're able to make that, Dr. Armetta, and of course, Noah as well. I'll be there. Don't worry. I want to see that movie. It has Johnny Depp in it. It it looks... (laughs) I haven't seen it, and if I did, it was a very long time ago, but I'm looking forward to it. Another Halloween-themed movie, and nice to see Professor Black's going to be stepping up and and presenting. Well, Dr. Armetta, we have so much to talk about here today with you since we got off track there to get the show started, and it was my (laughs) fault, and I will take the blame for it. Uh, Well, the first things first, and, and maybe most importantly, is... I wanted to 
give you a congratulations on behalf of the Nightly News for being promoted to associate professor here at Central Penn College. So Thank first you. of all, uh, I, I'm really interested, and I've never asked you this question, but tell us more about what your dissertation was about, maybe what some of your research interests have been over the past, you know, your professional career. Mm -hmm. So let's start there because I'm so close to finishing my dissertation. But tell me more about what you did your dissertation about. Thank you so much. Uh, no one has asked me that in a very long time. So I'm honored. And it's been a really exciting process. Uh, my dissertation was about the um, visual approach to narrating a novel. And what I essentially did was I took three Victorian novelists who had studied the visual arts before they became writers. And I made an argument that studio practices in the 19th century, the process of sort of choosing the angle from which you will draw the model, the process of learning how to draw in the first place, which was different for women most often than it was for men because of rules about what kinds of classes women could access, um, the process of sort of uh, having uh, social connections between sort of artists and other members of the public, those were all dictated in the way the novels are narrated by the visual arts studies that the novelists had been involved in before they became writers. So I looked at William Thackeray and Charlotte Bronte and Anthony Trollope as the three sort of trained artists who became novelists. And then I sort of did a test case with Charles Dickens, who was not at all ever a visual artist, oh. but loved art studied it a great deal and wrote about it quite a lot and was friends with a lot of artists. So I sort of looked at the differences between narration in these first three, the the voiceover, the, the sort of um, storytelling voice that connects all the events in the story in those first three novelists versus Dickens. And I made an argument that it was, um, sorry to... <laughs> no, 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 please. My argument was that there was a sort of progressive social value that grew up through these artistic practices that shows up in those novels. How did you land on this? Because one of the one of the toughest things for me was there were so many things I was interested in yeah. that I had to really hone in on one. How did you hone in on this? Um, I studied art history as an undergraduate. That's one of my undergraduate degrees. And I also have two parents who are artists and a husband who is an artist. And so <laughs> yeah, makes I sense. love... It comes in the family. I, I talk about these things. I love looking at art. I worked in museums for a long time before I started my dissertation, and it just felt like a natural fit. And so what have been some of the research interests that you've had? I know that you recently uh, presented at a conference. Tell us about that. What were some of the things that you talked about at the conference presentation? Oh, yeah, that was really fun. That was at the Northeast MLA in Boston, and I went with Professor Stuckey at her um, invitation. We had a wonderful scholarly time together. Uh, we put together a panel proposal, and it was about food access and sort of visions of the body and we sort of played with that word a little bit the body politic or you know the physical body in 19th century literature and my particular presentation was on Dickens and his presentation of art models who were often described in sort of oh this is going to be a struggle <laughs> they were often not in Dickens's short stories seen as a quote-unquote whole person. They often complain that an artist only wants to see like a particular piece of them. They only like me for my eyes or something, oh. and they don't want the, the whole me. Um, and I made this case that that's a Dickensian reference to two different kinds of artistic practice um, for the Victorians. One is the sort of genre painting where you see just this basic generic person described as like quote unquote young Italian woman or something like that. And so it's often just this sort of unidentifiable, vaguely featured young pretty girl holding a basket of fruit. And it's called mm. a genre painting. It's supposed to just sort of decorate the wall. And that's as opposed to a portrait, which is very much about the individual and particular features of a person. It's not necessarily intended to, quote unquote, make that person look pretty, but rather it's supposed to recognize and, and value the individual for who she is, for who he is. And so I talked about the way that value has played out 
for us in the 21st century. Noah, what do you think about that? As a, a burgeoning researcher, you know, getting to listen about all of the interests that we have as scholars, and part of our job, yes, is is teaching in the classroom, but part of our job also is to research and, and find our sort of niche in the scholarly area. What do you think about um, uh, us being able to pursue the, the interests that we have? You see, hearing all this, hearing you talk about your dissertation in class, her here, it's just, it's fascinating to see how deep you guys have dived to really find and dig out the information that you um, desire to display your knowledge and intelligence to the masses. It is, um, it's inspiring, uh, truly, but... I, I, I want to just interject there for a second. You love the audio field. Yeah, I do. They're, okay, at the conference that I have gone to and the Popular Culture Association, they have a literal field of audio studies. And so should you down the road ever want, and you're certainly capable of doing this, want to pursue Absolutely. these types of research endeavors, you could research about how different types of audio impact people. Uh, you know, even just in the audio field, a lot of discussion about podcasting and parasocial relationships, meaning that, you know, the more you listen to a podcast, the more you feel like you know someone who... I've heard of parasocial you know, relationships. So, so things like that, those are the types of, if, if these are your interests, this is, is how you can do research in this area and create new knowledge. That's the, this is the last thing I want to say, but the, the most important thing that I've learned in my PhD program is what we're doing is creating new knowledge. We're, we're not rehashing a bunch of stuff like you might in a, a paper in my class. Mm -hmm. You are using that foundation to develop your own research and then create new knowledge through that research. Dr. Armeda did that in her dissertation and even in her uh, conference presentations. You know, I'm attempting to do the same thing right now. And that's what to me is so interesting about this is from now on, people might look back to my piece and Dr. Armeda's piece as a foundation to advancing the, the research that we're doing, which I think is really interesting. Okay. Well, when you put it that way, that's amazing. And um, so what you're saying really is you're creating a foundation of research for the future generations beyond mm -hmm. you and for those who want to create new ideas because what you're doing right now you're researching you're creating new ideas you're generating a new thought strand like 100 percent. that that's is the hope, that, yeah. that's amazing so if i were to do that i think i want to research into i think parasocial relationships is a very uh, very interesting topic and it can create there's so many crimes that happen because of that and so much craziness. <laughs> I want to go into the psychology of why that is because... Guess what? Sounds the world is your oyster. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the, yeah. The world is your oyster, my friend. So I really hope that uh, down the line you're able to do something like that. Of I course. just want to say really quickly too, if I may, sure. one of the joys of um, sort of narrowing your expertise over time is that you get to connect with people who think along the same lines as you do or who want to talk about your idea because of how it relates to theirs. And one of my most, you know, wonderful experiences uh, for last term when I went to this conference was collaborating with Dr. Amanda Stuckey, who is an incredible writer and researcher herself. She's a fantastic teacher. And mm -hmm. just talking with her about how do we want to word our call for papers? What do you want to do when you moderate this panel? You know, who are these other folks on the panel and what will they be talking about? It's just so intellectually stimulating to share conversation with somebody who values the same things that you do. It is amazing. I've had so many conversations with people. When you, when you truly meet, you know, your clique, your group, yeah, um, the conversation just sparked. They just start bouncing off each other. Ideas bounce off, and it's such an amazing feeling when you finally do that. So I can one hundred percent agree with that. One of the greatest feelings of my life was when I was at PCA and I had an eight o'clock Friday morning panel. So it Ouch. wasn't as heavily attended as I would have. <laughs> Ours hoped. was early too. Yeah, we, I had I had a good crowd, so I'm not complaining. There was a person in the crowd during the Q&A that said that my panel was the one panel that he was really looking forward to throughout the whole conference. That's and of course, that made me feel no great. Way. You know, I grabbed his information and I've been in touch with him ever since. <laughs> Are you guys but, best friends now? Well, I mean, certainly colleagues, you know, I mean, he, he, he works nowhere near here, but I hope that, you know, if I can continue going to PCA year after year, that that's a, a relationship we can continue Imagine to Imagine that sprouts into the beautiful friendship and then you be, guys go to each other's like uh, second weddings or whatever. Hey, you never know. Uh, 
on. <laughs> All right. So uh, the, really, an, uh, one of the other main things that I want to talk about, and again, congratulations on your promotion and your recent scholarly activity. I wish you all Thank the best you. moving forward. But recently, there was a uh, poetry competition with which several students from Central Penn College got involved. And you also recently had a poetry event in yes. the library, of which uh, myself and my class was a part of. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about that and kind of tie a little bow on that, The not only just the competition, but the event itself. So let's start with the competition. Tell us a little bit more about what this competition is, how you got your students involved, and the success of, of some of our uh, fellow knights. I'm so glad you asked. This has been such an exciting thing for me to work on this uh, past several terms, actually. Uh, uh, over a year ago, the Academy of American Poets reached out to me by email and said that they are uh, running a contest for student poets, that they award a prize, that they would love to see us take part at Central Penn College, and was I interested? And I wrote back, absolutely, immediately. Thanks to you, Dr. Brant Ellsworth, and again to my um, colleague, Dr. Amanda Stuckey. I sort of talked to them both about, would this work? Would this make sense? Uh, do we have a place for this? Who would like to help? And so mm. um, that was the beginning of it. What the uh, Academy of American Poets does is invite uh, students to submit poems. At each college, the people who are involved with the contest will choose a sort of panel of uninfluenced judges. I'm, not, I'm, I'm losing the word for what that means. Uh, unbiased? For, yeah, unbiased yeah. judges, uninvolved, uncompromised, let's say. They don't know anything about it. They don't know anything. They don't know who wrote the poet, the poems. Mm -hmm. Dr. Stuckey and I put out a call for students to submit up to three poems. It could be any length and any topic. The, the Academy stipulates we can't say what the topic should be or ever how long the poem should be. So we can just say how many you can submit and by when. We got over uh, 30 poem wow. submissions, which I thought for a first run was really exciting. I, a lot of people came back to us um, with their submissions, and we were just really impressed with the quality and excited about that. So we had a panel of three absolutely wonderful and very hardworking judges who read these poems. And uh, they used some sort of rubrics to evaluate what these poems were doing and how they used language, what the form was playing with and things like that. Um, and they chose their top two. The Academy awarded a cash prize and eventual website publication to the first place winner. Wow. And Central Pen gave um, a Central Pen prize to the second place winner. So... It was just a really exciting process. Can you give a shout out to those people who won? Yeah, who won? I would be overjoyed oh. to give a shout out. I actually have our published uh, book of poems right here. The first place winner was Haley Boggs That's for awesome. her beautiful poem, The Crow and I. And the second place winner was Leo Rivera for his beautiful poem, Ton Parfum Mourant. I don't know how to pronounce Which that. is uh, your, your crying perfume, uh, perfume or like the, the tears of your perfume. Was the whole poem in French? Uh, no, just the uh, title, that which I cool. thought was very witty. That been cool. Real yeah. quick, I do want to ask you, what is the title of the book? Because I know you have a copy down the library in case anyone would like to go down and check it out so yes. they can locate it. Thank you so much for asking. We called it Poems for All Seasons. And we wanted to honor all the poets who had submitted. The first and second place winners are featured in here, but so are submissions from other poets. So uh, it's Poems for All Seasons, and we put Volume 1 because we expect and hope to do more. Oh, and, yeah. And again, of course, you can go down to the library. Of course, you can just ask the circulation desk uh, how you can locate Poems for All Seasons, yes, Volume 1. Absolutely. And now as, as sort of a, a thank you, I, I don't want to say a kickoff because it's sort of the opposite of a kickoff. It's sort of the wrap up. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a really interesting event just a couple of weeks ago at the library. Um, you had, you know, refreshments and everything else. But I mean, there was at least 20 people at the event, if yeah. I had to guess. Yep. And each person throughout the duration of the event brought a poem, not all written on their own, some, including myself, brought poems that spoke to us about a certain topic yeah. and read them. And honestly, first of all, I thought it was really interesting that a couple of the students in my class 
never told me they were in this. <laughs> in the and book. then we yep. show up and you're like, oh, yeah, you know, t- uh, Abby and Emily Brown were both in the book. And I was so happy that yep. they got to actually read their poems in front of the group there. Tell me more about the event uh, beyond what I've, I've sort of prefaced it with yeah. and, and about your perceived success of the event. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, um, we wanted to show the poets who had submitted um, their published work. I don't know what they were expecting, but we wanted not to just like print out a bunch of pages at Staples, but go a little further. <sighs> and so um, what we ended up being able to put together, Dr. Stuckey and I, um, was a published volume with all of the poems, the, you know, po- of course, the authors are listed here, and it ended up being illustrated as well. If I tell you why, your your mind will probably be blown. Um, The typesetter for this book actually called me while she was working on it, and she said, some of these are so inspiring that I've been crying over these poems. No way! (laughs) I'd like to bring them alive a little bit more on the page with illustrations. Do I have your permission? And I said, I'm overjoyed that these have meant so much to you. She actually specifically called out Leo's poem. It's a poem about loss. This typesetter had recently experienced a loss of her father herself, and she said, this really spoke to me. Um, And so I said, of course, please run with illustrations. And then we collaborated a little bit on um, choosing imagery. But for the most part, this was just her reaction to how exciting and visceral and inspiring these works were. So it was really fun. Did the typesetter draw them herself? No, she she didn't. She located images. Um, Oh, there were images? offline or were they illustrated by author like I'm actually she didn't share that information oh, with uh, me uh, I know that they were you know no uh, open no, uh, copyright if, images it's but. like you take your car to the garage and they say hey don't worry it's on us right oh. <laughs> it, we, we don't know where they get the paint or the parts from <laughs> Yeah. But um, uh, so but t- what did you think about the event itself? I mean, to me it was super ex- inspiring to it see. Was. You had been through the process though. So I'm curious what what your thoughts were. Well, first of all, we put out the call for everyone to come and receive their copy of the book and to celebrate their work, not realizing that so many people who weren't involved in the contest would show up. So t- to both of you, just a huge thank you for being there, Professor Miller for bringing your students, uh, Professor Lyrell we brought some students and we did feel like it was an exciting sort of view of a slice of the college community that were there to talk about the glory of poetry. It was just a really honoring thing for me to see this. No, I want to get your perception in just a second, but I'm going to leave with this. As somebody who doesn't know much about poetry, I'm not, I've never been a, a, a poet by any means and and really haven't studied it much either i was so inspired to see how much the students gravitated to it i Uh, really was too it was amazing it it was it was a breath of fresh air in a way you know because absolutely to see how at first i kind of thought people maybe wouldn't be sure about the event itself you know we were were missing class for it uh and it was certainly worth every second uh but whenever everyone was there and they were everyone brought a poem and got up and read it some of them were hesitant at first but then after people started going they stood up and absolutely it was it was just truly fantastic and and really an example of what can happen when we collaborate with our colleagues i mean this was something that i wanted to do because i have so much respect for both you and amanda and the things that you've done to put this together and everything that i thought it was going to be it blew out of the water with success for for the that's that's so wonderful to hear yeah i also feel like so many students are some of these, you guys are some of the most hardworking people, Noah, that I've ever met. <laughs> Many of you, you know, you're in these classes and then you go home and you're taking care of family members and you're d- doing part time or full time jobs as well. And you're involved mm-hmm. in clubs and you're doing internships. And it's a lot to also produce a creative work of art is a tremendous effort. And we wanted to show people this is valuable, this is worthwhile. And I feel like all of the support that we got at that event surely demonstrated that to these writers. And I hope we'll have sort of inspired some who haven't yet had the nerve to publish a poem or to submit something to a writing contest like ours would be excited to do that next year. That was really part of why we wanted to celebrate this. And Noah, what was your perception of the event? You were in attendance and, and also read a, a poem. Uh, I read what, two. Oh, you did read two. <laughs> what were your thoughts of the event in hindsight? 
so when I first went, I, I, I thought it was going to be like a, a crazy, like, a uh, big thing where we had to stand up on a stage. I didn't know it was going to be in the library. I, I for some reason I forgot. I thought it was going to be in the conference center, but um, uh, it wasn't the library. It was nice. It was compact, but it had a community sense. And, yeah, uh, I, I did have to jam like jumpstart it because I was forced to. They're like, you go first, and I was like, okay, <laughs> fine. So um, I did start it off with a, a Shakespearean poem, Sonnet 18. It's one of the most popular poems um, by Shakespeare. Um, it personally uh, spoke to me because I chose that poem to read when I was in high school in theater class oh, and I, love it. I also I love Shakespeare's romantic language I, I love that is that and, shall I compare thee to a summer's yeah, day yeah shall I yeah. compare thee to a summer's day that one that one is really good uh what I got from the event is first of all I didn't expect anyone to read anything but me like I genuinely like I know my classmates I know they're all shy and quiet so um to see them actually get up and read was very surprising to me it really uh, was i also didn't know emily or abby was in the book i still no, i still no thought one that was so no cool. one mentioned any of that to me at all they were just like oh yeah i'm in the book i'm like what you're in the book that's awesome like you have an entire poem that you took time to write and it got published in a physical copy that, that's amazing to me i've done stuff it's not really that will be in the library for all eternity yeah forever Absolutely. and that's one of the cool things that when when professor tom Davis and I got our book chapter published. The first thing I did was donate a copy to the library so that if anybody ever wants to read what we've done, but it's there, you know, what did you make? So we, we wrote a chapter in a rock icons book on Metallica. Oh, that's so excellent. So, um, we, again, so, so proud of that, that in 2022. And again, there's a copy down in the library. Just look up rock icons, uh, and, and you can find it. And, uh, I, I did ask that it doesn't leave the library, but uh, certainly yep. you can certainly go down and read it at any, any time that you like. But Dr. Armetta, I, I just want to conclude by saying you are just such a valued member of the, the, the faculty here. And it's such a great opportunity that we get to collaborate when we do. Of course, the film series was one of the most memorable, but this was really something special for the students to, again, to Noah's point, have a copy of something that they did put time into effort and energy and to be able to have something to show for it, I really think is awesome. And beyond that, maybe for some of these people, it inspires them to keep writing poetry absolutely we want that we want inspiration and to be to me that's what our job is is partially about yeah just giving people inspiration to continue on with something that maybe they didn't envision being part of of their lives and and exposing them to different things that maybe otherwise they wouldn't have been exposed to. And, and I mean, you, you hit, you hit a home run with, and again, I, I, Dr. Sucky is not here. Of course, we want to give a shout out to her because I know that she was equally involved in all of this, but I do just want to point out that thank you to the both of you for doing this. The event oh, was probably you. one of, will be the event of the summer in my personal it opinion. Was fun. Uh, That's amazing. It, it was, it was wonderful. And it, awesome. it was great that we had the opportunity as a class to come down and every, every single person walked away from that experience with a positive perspective on, on everything. My only complaint is that it was too short. Like, oh, I love longer. that. Well, we like, continued by going to party on the patio, if you remember, oh, you or many of us patio, did. The, yeah, the so that was delightful as well. I also want to personally say thank you to just you as a professor. Oh um, my goodness! I've had terrible English teachers in the past, and you like <laughs> broke the chain. Oh, and from no having way. you as like the first term, first English teacher of the term, that was awesome. You you really do teach in a way that all professors should. You're enthusiastic, and you you want everyone to get involved. You're not sitting there and blabbing off, and you're you're not boring. <laughs> and I just got okay now no do the assignment <laughs> like, oh, okay guys now how can we get this involved Let, let's have a group project let's have oh, everyone talk to each other like I, I like that and it's it was awesome it was awesome you really gave me the true college experience because it was my first class thank I've you ever had, Noah. So that means say thank you. so much to me yeah. I loved working with your class I have other very lively classes this summer and it's it's just a joy I really as you said professor miller to be part of this community who gets to share and collaborate and speak to each other's work and come and support each other at these events it's really what i love about central penn and my beloved colleagues and students oh and when you go up for full professor all you have to do is just we'll edit that little piece of audio there you go <laughs> that's right and, and, and there you go that's have that. a little quote right there that's yeah. what we got right i'll there. just keep just your email in my back pocket we'll put a we'll put a like a, a poster it'll have your picture and you'll be like Professor right Ameda. 
Awesome. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for your time today. It was wonderful to talk about all these great things that you're doing here on campus and in your own personal research. You know, to be honest, I, I don't know that we have enough of a platform for our faculty. Um, and, and I hope to maybe bring some more faculty on in the coming terms to talk with them about their research interests because this is, you know, part of the reason that we got into this industry is to be able to pursue some of the things that we are very passionate about. And, and you clearly do that. So thank you thank so you. much for your time. Thank you for putting this together, this event. And I, you know, we just look forward to it next year as well. Wonderful. Let's get some silent claps. Uh, don't peek uh, the microphone. <laughs> silent claps. And, and Noah, of course, thank you for your insight and, and being such an integral part of the event itself. You, you absolutely you did, w did read multiple poems. So I do give yeah, you a shout out. I kind of like, I don't know, I guess I kind of did guide the event. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. But but no, you you continue to just be an absolute all star here and, and just keep being you and, and doing your thing and you're going to be very successful well, when the well, time thank comes. You. I appreciate Absolutely. It. Uh, I don't wanna I don't wanna say all that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All star is well, crazy. Well, thank you all so much for listening today. I wanna thank Dr. Flora Armeta for being here, our new associate professor of English, and of course Nightly News reporter Noah Lopez. Noah, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you guys. Thank you, Armeta. Thank you, Professor Miller, for creating the podcast. Podcast. You Absolutely. We're, we're getting, we're, yeah, we're getting, right. I've hosted, uh, well, we're on episode 195. We're ever close to, close to 200. We're getting close to 200. That's amazing. And we will be announcing a celebration to uh, ring in the 200th podcast here before too long. Make sure so. you guys Fantastic. come on down to that party. There's going to be free food. I repeat, free <laughs> food. <laughs> and Dr. Armetta, thank you so much for your time. Today. Thank you, Professor Miller and Noah. Uh, yes. All right. Well, hey, that's going to do it for this episode of the Nightly News Podcast. For Dr. Armetta and Noah Lopez, this is Professor Paul Miller. And we'll see you again next time on the Nightly News Podcast. Yeah.